I would like to introduce our opening keynote speaker. So Stuart Maddock is the John Norris McGuire Professor of Information Technologies at MIT Sloan. He holds a PhD in computer science from MIT and has been a faculty member since 1972. Uh, he has served as the head of the MIT Sloan Information Technologies Group, consistently ranked number one in the nation for more than 20 years. Uh, he currently serves as director of cybersecurity at MIT Sloan Research Initiative. So please join me in welcoming Stuart Maddock. Well, good morning. It's great to see you all. In fact, I was going to comment as I was meeting people last night and this morning, you look so much larger than you did on Zoom. <laughs> Question, how many of you are here in Cambridge for the first time? Anybody? A handful here and there. The reason I mention it, those who don't know this, the MIT Museum, I'm not sure what's because of so many things being disrupted during COVID, changed from its location. It was, it was actually on Mass Ave and has been rebuilt, a new one in Kendall Square that just opened literally a few weeks ago. So those who have time while you're here, you may want to take a look at it. It's quite exciting. Last question. How many of you are part of either CIOs or part of a CIO organization in your company? The vast majority. So I'm going to talk about a topic. Let me see if I can get this to work here. Uh, about the issue of the CIO as a chief regulation officer. Now, when I've given talks like this before, I often start off by saying that there is a tsunami of regulations coming your way. Get your lifeboats ready. And that's kind of what I think is over the lifeboat. But I also want to talk about the role of the CIO, in many cases, of trying to bail out his organization. So how many of you so far have experienced an increase of activity due to regulations? Is that something that many of you have experienced yet? I see a handful of going up. So for those of you who've been lucky enough to not experience it, I'm going to try to take a limited amount of time to give you an idea of some of the things to look forward to in the near future. Now, let me give some context. And once again, I don't know if anybody here from the government, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But one of the things you realize is that governments, every now and then, can, they do monitor public opinion. And when things seem to be contentious, out there, they say, we've got to do something. Now, they're not going to write new firewalls. They're not going to come up with new cryptographic algorithms. What do governments do? They come up with new regulations and new legislations. And so that's typically what's going on. And for those who've been monitoring it, they're coming from everywhere, from the White House, from Congress. Pick any three letters, occasionally four-letter agencies, and they're coming out with regulations. And not just at the federal level in the United States, there are at least 36 states that have enacted various types of cyber regulation. And of course, this is going around the world, in Europe, China, Russia, you name it. So it's going on everywhere. And almost all of these regulations have a direct impact on the CIO and the CIO organization. That's why we use the phrase here that you now become the chief regulation officer. Of course, CRO is also used for chief risk officer, chief religion officer. R is a popular letter, apparently. So I'm going to talk about five examples. I may not cover all five of them because I do want to make sure I leave time for the panel coming after me. But I'm going to talk about the issue of requirements regarding incident reporting, requirements regarding software bill of materials, requirements regarding security by design, a kind of a subtle issue here regarding prohibition on ransomware payments and data governance. I'm sure all of you are deeply involved in data governance. So these are five areas. I kind of highlighted in brown some of these things may sound vaguely familiar to you, or at least something that you may have realized on your agenda. So let me go through each of them one by one. Requirement for incident reporting. Now I'm going to, I'm going to do a scientific experiment here. As many of you know, Many of the regulations involving reporting are focused on the issue of privacy. So if personal information is disclosed in many countries, in many states, you are required to disclose it. On the other hand, if your plant is shut down 
or how many people here know that the city of Lowell, the third large city in Boston, has been locked down for about a week now? A lot of it doesn't get into the press. So the question is, what percent of cyber attacks do you think are reported? How many people think it's over 50 percent? How many people think it's over 25 percent? How many people, oh, how many people over 10 percent? Getting warmer now. Some people claim it's almost 1 percent. I raise this because in some sense we don't know what we don't know. And so, for example, a cyber attack that happened just down the street from here that may be based upon something that I could do something about in my company, if I don't know about it, I can't do anything about it. So there's been a big push around the world to do something to improve reporting of cybersecurity incidents, if you will. And for example, many of you may have realized that the Colonial Pipeline, which had a lot of press coverage about it, in fact, wasn't required to report anything. Of course, if 10,000 gas stations close up, somebody might suspect something's going on. So sometimes these things are hard to hide. And of course, I don't know how many of you have had to deal with this yet. I don't even ask how many of you have experienced a cyber attack in your company. But the first thing that the lawyers in your company and your insurance company say is, don't say anything. So in fact, you know, trying to learn from other cyber attacks is a major challenge. And of course, there are all kinds of complexities. Even when organizations and agencies and governments say you must report things, being clear as to what you must report, when you must report it, and how you must report it varies all over the place, creating a real hodgepodge and a huge amount of effort on many organizations. So let me just give you a couple examples, if you will. Within the United States, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, that is a mouthful, requires that if you are in the critical infrastructure, which is going to be almost everybody, obviously your know, power grid is and the water treatment, but so is financial services, so is transportation. I'm not sure what pizza fits, but with MIT final exams coming up, I think pizza fits is a critical infrastructure, at least for that time of the year. So anybody in the critical infrastructure must be reported. How many of you are, are familiar with or have looked at this issue of the Securities Exchange Commission, SEC regulations? Okay. Now, I don't quite know exactly where they stand because this has gone through a lot of turmoil. The motivation behind it, if you think about it, makes sense because these are all public companies that have investors. And investors should know if your company is doing well or not doing well financially, but also to know whether they're doing well or not doing well cybersecurely, if you will. So the idea here is disclosure, a full disclosure or transparency. So they're saying that if you suffer a cyber incident, you should let your shareholders know about it, which of course, everybody then knows about it. So that's a big issue. Now, I've not been involved in Washington as a how this ball is being bounced around, but one thing that was added from an earlier version of it is they're only required to report incidences that are material, which of course leaves kind of open what is a non-material versus what is a material incident. Because the requirement is you must report it within four days after you determine it's material, which might take three or four weeks or months. So there's, there's a lot going on in terms of exactly how these things will be enforced, but these are important areas. So let me ask you a question. How many of you in your organization are aware of or have to deal with any incident reporting requirements so far? Any, I see a handful of answers. Was it fun? <laughs> Not exactly, okay. So but the, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, stay tuned, coming your way. Now, the next one's kind of interesting. Software bill of materials. For any of you who've been in the manufacturing space know quite a bit about bill of materials. Those are the components that go into subassemblies, and those subassemblies that go into main assemblies, and those main assemblies go into the final product. So it's a hierarchy of components that are assembled together. Now, I don't know how many of you really think about this, but the same thing occurs in software. There are small you know, routines and modules that are pulled together to make some function. Those functions then combine to make some product, which then combine to make some maybe larger product. So there was a hierarchy. How many of you, I know people like to blot things out, but how many of you remember the log4j issue about a year ago? 
Okay. Yeah, I see a lot of, I know a number of companies set up war rooms, it turns out, regarding Log4j. Because Log4j was a particular piece of, of open source software that was very well regarded and widely used. But it wasn't necessarily used by you. It was used within some module, some application that you bought or took on or acquired that went into your system. And so the question is, deep down within your system, is there a version of Log4j lurking around ready to be exploited? And many companies didn't know that because they knew the modules that they had acquired, but they didn't know what was inside those modules that may have been acquired by somebody further down the chain. So that led to the idea of being, well, just like we have bill of materials for products, so we know all the components, you know, what kind of, of nuts and bolts go into your car, we need to have a way to know, is there a log4j in your system? Or is there some other vulnerability inside your system? And that led to the idea of saying that companies should have a software bill of materials. Now, of course, this is being motivated by cybersecurity concerns, but if you think about it, it kind of makes good sense. You know, one of the biggest issues we often find is companies have difficulty knowing what their inventory is. As someone once said, you know, computers are popping up all over a company like weeds, so we don't no idea. And, 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 and likewise, people leave, we don't know where the computers go and so on. So there's a big inventory issue on the hardware side, but this is kind of the inventory issue on the software side. What kind of software do we have? And by the way, I focused here on software, but as the bottom of the slide points out, some people argue that data has the same kind of properties and we need to know what data is, goes in. You know, we have some piece of data we're using, but that piece of data is really an assembly of other pieces of data, which are assemblies of other pieces of data. And so do we actually know, for example, not just what data do we have, but where did it come from, the provenance of the data? It may be that at some point we find it's a problem or some unreliability regarding a certain source of data. Are we actually using that source? And do we know about it? So people are talking about a data uh, bill of materials as well. And in that regard, there are a number of examples, if you will. The, uh, the NIST guidelines refer, by the way, the good news and bad news. Anybody here from government agencies? Not a lot of hands going up. The good news and bad news, a lot of these regulations first start by addressing government, regulate, government agencies, because the government more or less has direct control over them. But almost always these things then ripple down to the private sector. So the fact that it may not be on your doorstep now doesn't mean it isn't coming down the road. So for example, for all vendors supplying software to the federal government, it is mandatory that they have a software bill of materials. And if you will also, if you're supplying things to the Department of Energy requires a software bill of materials. I'm gonna give you examples of what's going on in the US and examples going on in Europe. There are other parts of the world I want to acknowledge. I just, for, for brevity today, I'll just focus on those two parts of the world because it is going on globally. It's not just a US issue. It's not just a European issue. These are global issues going on everywhere. And likewise, there are similar things going on in Europe. Next one I want to talk about, oh, by the way, let me question either before or after these things happen. How many of you in your company currently have software bill of materials? So it seems like maybe 15, 20%. So some of you may want to do it just because it's, it's good for your operations, but many of you may want to do it so you're prepared for what might be coming down the road. Now, security by design. Um, I don't, once again, I don't know what your experience is, and obviously it, I find it varies quite a bit between uh, large companies and small companies and startup companies, but there's always this urge to get your product out the door as fast as possible. In the case of small companies, that can make the difference between survival or non-survival. What we find time and time again is you say, well, I know security is important, but I've got lots of other things I've got to do to get this product out the door. Once I got the product out the door, I'll come back and address the security issues that I've kind of put off to the side. I don't know whether you, I'm sure none of you have that experience, but you may know of others who do. The trouble is, number one, a lot of times in that gap, before you add the security features, that's when the, the attackers hack you. But more importantly, quite often, it's very hard 
a lot of things that you could have done at the beginning become very hard to tack on later on. So there is a push to say that, secu much like I'm not sure which uh, automotive company had it, that security is number one or quality is number one, is the idea that security should be thought of at the beginning rather than at the effort. And that's often referred to as security by design. Um, and there are examples of that in the United States. It started off, my mother said, there are a lot of things going on at the federal level, but often a lot of things going on at the state level. So in California, they're requiring that manufacturers have reasonable security features. I wouldn't say that's a particularly strong requirement, but it gives you an idea that legislations and regulations are coming out talking about the fact that security needs to be there before the product goes out the door. It's much clearer, I think, at the moment in Europe where they refer to in the Network and Information Security Directive that the companies must adhere to security by design principles. Of course, leaving somewhat ambiguous what that is, but it definitely says security by design is something that we're requiring you to address. Now, I'm gonna, I know time is getting tight, so I'm gonna go and, oh, my watch is not even working, how's that? Uh, must be a cyber attack. Uh, and talk about one more topic I find interesting. How, no, I'll close my eyes if you do. How many of you have suffered a ransomware attack in your company? Okay, nobody, that's good news. <laughs> but one of the issues here is there, is there is a big movement going on to prohibit paying ransom after a ransomware attack. Does someone want to volunteer? Why, why would you want to prohibit it? Any volunteer want to speak up? Yes. Exactly. You think of incentives. If you know that if you do a ransomware attack, nobody will pay you, why bother? Now, you may want to be malicious or cause chaos, but you know, most people are kind of profit motivated. So if everybody does, refuses to pay ransom, in theory, the ransomware is, they'll, they'll find something else to do, but they'll move off from that, which is a big deal. That's in fact, was what Lowell's locked down. I think Dallas is locked down this week. I'm not sure. This, there were 37 government agencies locked down last week with ransomware attacks. So the idea here is to prohibit it so as to discourage it. One of the problems is it works brilliantly if everybody does it. And the trouble is, it's not. You could put a sign in your door: "We don't pay ransom. Don't attack us." But then again, it's it's you know a lot of ransomware attacks are not necessarily targeted. They kind of just blanket look for vulnerabilities. Like, do you have Log4j? If you do, I'm going to go ransomware attack you. And I don't check and see whether your front door says we never pay ransoms. So only if he, if everybody refuses to pay ransom does it really have a real effect. But that is an issue going on, and we're already seeing examples in the United States. It turns out it's going on primarily at the, at the state level. I think uh, North Carolina, I believe, was the first state that prohibits public entity. I, I gotta say, before I go any further, I gotta say something. I'm sure many of you are very conscious of the requirements and your obligations to your company. The trouble is we got in this idea of not paying ransom. Let me give you a scenario. I, anybody here from Baltimore? But as you may remember, about a year and a half ago, Baltimore was hit with a fairly major ransomware attack. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but roughly goes as follows. The ransomer said, we'll give you back your city, if you will, for a million dollars. And they, for whatever reason, said, we're not going to do it. We're going to rebuild our systems. At least in one report, it cost them $18 million. Now, if you were a stockholder or an investor in Baltimore, which of course is a public company, if you will, and you said there's a product I can buy, I can pay $1 million for that product, or I can pay $18 million for the product, and I choose to pay $18 million. How long do you think it will go before you get a lawsuit? So there's a real serious issue here. But in any case, in the state of North Carolina, they prohibited it. Uh, there is others, in fact, I'm not sure where to stand. A lot of these things are proposed, some of these things are enacted, but this affects a lot of people. The Ransomware and Financial Stability Act says that any U.S. financial institution cannot make a ransomware payment in excess of 100,000. I'm not sure why you pick a magic number, but the idea being, well, we won't worry about the small change one, but we don't want you paying big bucks. So these are things that are going on in the USA, and likewise, there are similar things going on in Europe. 
as I said, so far these things are mostly going on at the governmental level, government agencies and so on. I don't know how many of you thought about this or what your policies your company have, but when these regulations start to trickle down to your company level, these are things you need to think about. Now, I, I want to get off the stage. We are, we, data governance, has anybody heard of data governance? I think it's something CIOs has had. So it turns out there's a lot of regulations involving data governance, things like do, data localization. If you're operating in, the, in our country, you're gathering data and customers in our country, the data must stay in our country. Well, how do I do global consolidation? Good luck to you. So there's a lot of issues on the data regulation side. There are many other areas that are going on. And so these are just some of the areas. I've tried to give you four or five. As I said, there is a flood of regulations coming your way. Some of them are kind of stalled. Some of them are, are emerging slowly. But it, it, it's, it's almost unsus, unstoppable. So those of you who haven't thought about it, haven't thought about what role you, because almost all of these either directly or indirectly relate to the CIO office. So I want to thank you all and have a great time here in Cambridge. <laughs>